All right, we're going to have a, a conversation here about, uh, about a game that Steve wrote that basically sparked computer games and, and everything that we're doing today. Um, so what we're going to, this, this, is, this is a big history lesson, this whole thing here. <laughs> so, um, so make sure you guys get your passport stamped. I don't know if that actually is a game here, like pat, stamping the passport. All right, good. Because <laughs> I, was, I was hoping it looked really fun. So, um, okay, so we'll start, um, this is, Space War uh, was, was started in 1961, and um, so we'll go back a little bit before Space War to, uh, like, what happened before Space War? What were you, like, how did you get an interest in computers, and what kind of led up to the creation of that game? Well, um, I went to Dartmouth College for, for four years. <laughs> And like many people, I didn't graduate. <laughs> um, but I got an excellent education. And uh, one, of the th one of my professors was John McCarthy. I was majoring in math. And uh, he got me a summer job between my junior and senior year at MIT, where I did various things. I, wrote some Fortran programs. Fortran had just come out. It had no numbers. It was just Fortran. Nice. It wasn't 77, the one that like, anyone would remember. 57. OK. <laughs> uh, so uh, I did that. And I thought computers were fun. And John seemed to think that I uh, had some aptitude in the thing. So I went back and did my senior year and didn't quite finish up. But he had offered me a job. And he didn't care. And so I started working at MIT for John McCarthy. Uh, he and Marvin Minsky had just started the Artificial Intelligence Project. And um, so uh, we hand compiled uh, a language that uh, talked about symbolic expressions for a couple of months. And John then wrote a function that he called the universal, S or universal M expression which described an interpreter which would interpret the language. And the language got named Lisp for Lisp processing language. And so I looked at what John had written out. And since I'd been hand compiling that sort of thing for a couple of months, I said, oh, I can do that. And uh, John didn't object too much, although later on he said, that was a little premature. <laughs> but <laughs> that's funny. So that was that was Lisp, and I guess that started in '58 uh, and went. Uh, the first version was running in uh, December '58, okay. and uh, th there was a rather disastrous. Well, mm -hmm. there was an exciting was seminar. <laughs> uh, Jim Slagle, who was a blind graduate student and very smart, needless to say, uh, was working on doing symbolic integration in Lisp. And so he had a seminar which explained wh how, what his functions looked like and how they were going to work. And those of us who knew the interpreter were sitting in the back and we started muttering, oh, that's not going to work. Kapur the interpreter won't handle that. <laughs> and so after considerable agony, we had figured out a way around it that didn't hurt too much. But uh, was hard to compile. He was stressing the language, and you guys had to find a way to, to make yeah, it work. Yeah, well, it, I mean, he had just used it in a straightforward way. And since all of us had some math background, we thought that if it was straightforward and obvious, that's the way it ought to work. should be able to do that. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the, function, the, thing, the fix that we invented was called the function fun arg hack, uh, because it was felt to be despicable because it was uh, rather complicated, and it wasn't clear how to compile it efficiently. Um, but it made the interpreter work, and it made his function work. So I rewrote the interpreter in the spring of 62, or 52. Mm -hmm. No, no, had to be 59. Uh, to, to work, to work right, and he he got his function working, and he got his thesis. Great. So, um, at the time, the big computer of the time that we were using, the biggest computer available, was an IBM 704. Now this is a vacuum tube computer that 
needed about 2,000 square feet of false floor and a very enthusiastic air conditioning system <laughs> uh, to, to work. And it was, um, it didn't cost MIT the full list price, but the list price was about uh, two, mil two million, two and a half million dollars. Wow, that was a lot back then. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, that trans, th this, it tr translated to about $200 an hour when I was getting paid $10 an hour. Oh, <laughs> don't so, mess around. <laughs> Um, the computer was much more expensive than me, okay. so uh, I had to wait for the computer a lot. Uh, I would we'd prepare card decks, uh, Lisp was written in assembler, and uh, so we'd prepare card decks and it ended up being about uh, four big trays of cards, about 12,000 cards, and we'd then take them down to the operations staff and present them with a card explaining where it was supposed to stop to the operations staff. And they would take the trays of cards, put them on tape, hopefully not dropping them, although occasionally they did, <laughs> uh, and uh, feed it to the computer, which would assemble, typically assemble a symbolic deck and then run it and when it didn't, if it didn't run the way you said it was, if it didn't stop at the place you said it was going to stop, uh, they would give you a dump of all of memory, which was something over 200 pages of <laughs> octal numbers. Octal. <laughs> this eight. is hex. This is what. <laughs> yeah. Pre hex, pre hexadecimal. Um, and so then you would take the assembly listing and uh, the octal dump and you try and decode what was going on. Um, and one of the things that I learned there, which, which I think fortunately uh, none of you have had to learn, is all about arithmetic. Because the 704, for reasonable architectural reasons, had one's complement arithmetic, two's complement arithmetic, sign magnitude arithmetic, and excess 200 octal arithmetic. <laughs> you have no idea how tedious it was to program on these computers back then. It, I think most of your time was not spent programming, but was just dealing with getting things in well, and it out was, of the it machine. Was, um, there were complications, but anyway, it took a couple of hours to analyze the dump, since right. it was list structure and you had to chase it all down. <laughs> uh, and uh, then you could uh, change the uh, program and try again. So typically you got maybe one run a day, maybe if you were exceedingly lucky, two runs a day. That's but slow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it took more than, usually took more than one run to kill an interesting bug. Wow. Uh, there was an additional thing. You couldn't assemble things. It turned out with the vacuum tubes and the mag tape at the time, uh, getting 12,000 cards onto tape correctly was not a sure thing. <laughs> so the usual practice was you'd get the cards on tape, you'd get an assembly, you'd find a bunch of assembly errors, you'd discover some of them were due to not reading the cards correctly. So you'd make up a bunch of octal correction cards. Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> Overwrite, patching your code. Yeah, yeah, so you would patch the code. <laughs> and then as you found bugs, if they were easy to fix by patching, you would make an octal patch. And if they required something worse, then you go through the business of edit the card deck, send it through to assembly, fix the assembly errors, and then get back to debugging. Wow. So somehow you got to make a game, though, while, <laughs> while you're going through this crazy, tedious process. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so any, anyway, that was uh, where I started. With the tedium. And then in <laughs> 1961, something happened. Yep. In January, right? Uh, no, it was, uh, oh, yes. Uh, in January, the <laughs> Russians put a man into orbit. Yep. In April, the U.S. managed to get a man into orbit. The space race was on and very hot. Yeah. Then in uh, the fall of 1961, digital equipment, who had been, uh, had a, re a revolutionary transistorized computer, that was only the size of three or four refrigerators. 
<laughs> Much smaller. <laughs> didn't take up a room, so that's good. It didn't fit in your pocket either. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> anyway, they donated one to MIT. And it was down the hall from where I was working. And so I looked in on it. And a bunch of people, there were some undergraduate research assistants who worked on it. And we were all members of the Model Railroad Club. So uh, I looked in on it and saw what was going on. Now, one of the first things that was going on was Marvin Minsky wrote a program that he called the Minsky, uh, he called Tripos. And it, uh, it put three spots on the screen. And the spots were influenced by the sw setting you put in the switch data switches when you started the program. It was kind of a kaleidoscope. And what you learned was that a lot of the patterns were uninteresting. Uh, some of the ones that were interesting were interesting for a while, but they all evolved and they got more and more and more random as time went on. Um, it was fun to play with for a couple hours, but it got boring after a while. And I started talking up the idea that what we really needed was a better demonstration program. <laughs> a demonstration. Just make a demo. Yeah. You need yeah. a really cool demo for this right, machine. Right. Okay. <laughs> uh, now, while, while I was talking, the Model Railroad Club guys had uh, cornered the, uh, their boss, uh, Professor Jack Dennis, and insisted on translating the assembler that they had on TX0, which was next door, for the PDP-1. And they did it over a weekend. It's uh, pretty fast. <laughs> yeah, well, they, they, they knew the design that they were copying. And they agreed and managed to adhere to, we're not going to change a thing in the design. Right. So it was just taking code they'd written once, writing it again for, another pr for a different processor. And then getting it in that was on a uh, switchboard? They no, didn't have to the, do decks or? Uh, the, the way uh, you assembled things on the, there was an assembler on the PDP-1, but it was kind of lame. Okay. <laughs> it had originally been designed to work in 1K of memory, because that's what was on the prototype. Right. <laughs> uh, that's 1K words, yeah. big 18-bit words. <laughs> um, so the, they had the assembler, and then they added other, some other things. They took their debugger and translated that. <coughs> and then they um, had a, a utility program that would take the that you ran after the assembler that would punch out your symbols, the, sim the assembler symbol table, onto the tape. And they had this debugging program that would read in your program and read in the symbol table. And it would do online assembly and disassembly in terms of the symbols you would use for writing the program, not glorious octal. That was great. <laughs> and this so look, this looked like an interesting way to use a computer. It looked like it was going to be a lot more fun than, the, of the than reading dumps. Yeah. <laughs> so I really wanted to try it. And uh, my, my, we talked up what was a better demonstration program, and I started promoting the idea that something that taught people how to, how to fly a spaceship would be a good thing. Because of what was happening during that year. Well, and also it, it would sort of fit. Right. And you wanted someone else to do this. Well, I was hoping someone <laughs> else would do this. But uh, in the style of such things, um, the, the usual reaction was sort of like, yeah, you know, that's a really good idea. You know, somebody ought to do that. Someone. Somebody who really, <laughs> understand, really understands the idea. Why don't you do it? <laughs> so I was shaved into writing some code. Yeah. <laughs> You had to. You, you didn't want to to start it until you got some math code, though, right? Well, I was sort of cornered into writing it, and so I had to think about how it was going to work. <laughs> and uh, I discovered, after a little poking around, that I could use uh, one vector for the direction that each object was pointed, right. and uh, do the sine and cosine of that vector once per cycle and then do everything else in terms of uh, the components of that vector. Cool. And 
So what I got working at the end of uh, 1961 was a program that displayed two spaceships on the screen and uh, had, I seemed like it needed some torpedoes, so it had torpedoes that would blow up spaceships and other torpedoes <laughs> and would sail around the screen. Um, I put this up, and people tried it, and told me I should change this and change that. And uh, so I uh, changed some things and fixed things up. And then um, Pete Sampson looked at my stars, which were very random, and he thought that they were horribly unrealistic. <laughs> <laughs> and so he coded up a star chart and presented me with a program that he called Expensive Planetarium. <laughs> so uh, this was a cl clever piece of code that took two pages of an assembler and, uh, and a big table. But So I, I put that in, and we had real stars. And Dan Edwards, who had worked with me on the LISP project and who wrote, was uh, deeply involved with the first garbage collector, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, looked at my display code, which was interpreting uh, cryptic three-bit uh, but three-bit codes for the outline, and he figured out a way to speed it up. He wrote what is apparently the first runtime compiler, which took the cryptic definition and compiled exactly the right code to keep the display on the computer running at full speed. Which was, what, 60 frames or 50? Well, the <laughs> there was a decay on the, it on was the points, the, right? The, it was the world's simplest display interface. <laughs> yeah. You put X in the accumulator, Y in the I.O. register, give the display instruction, you get a spot on the screen, and 50 microseconds later, you can do it again. So it's 50. <laughs> Basically, 50 microseconds, refresh, yeah. yeah. But, um, you just got a spot on the screen, and it decayed. And so if you wanted a fixed, uh, a, a fixed object, you had to keep redisplaying it. And those ships were made up of a bunch of little dots. Yes. And you had to do instructions per yeah. dot to make the whole display look like it was. But he compiled, he compiled his code that did an add, two shifts, and an add to go from the spot you were on to the next spot. Like a simple Bresenham, almost. Yeah. Like, okay. So. Um, he added that, and that gave us enough time to calculate the effect of gravity on the spaceships. <laughs> but we didn't have enough time to calculate the effect of gravity on the torpedoes, so we decided they were photon torpedoes, not affected by gravity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just go right through there and everything. <laughs> and um, so I, we bundled all that together and did some more debugging, and uh, in order to uh, deal with the people who said, you should change this parameter, change that parameter, you really ought to change things. I put all the parameters that affected the, the pace and the size of things, the number of torpedoes, in the first page, which uh, so as that people could uh, change it from the switches to suit themselves. And nobody did. <laughs> yeah, they were like, we want to be able to change this and that and the other, and you're like, here it is. And they're like, okay, well, whatever. <laughs> we don't want to flip switches. I mean, it was com it was complex to do this stuff back then. So well, you know, all, most of the audience understood uh, translating university from programmers. Options to switches. <laughs> uh, um, so, uh, oh, here's the yes. switches. That's here's how you here's programmed the console. it. The test word is where you control the Minskytron. Uh, on Space War, the left four switches and right four switches were the controls. <laughs> However, um, if you sat at the console, you had to turn your head to look at the display, and you got a crick in your neck if you played for an hour <laughs> or two. So one of the first things that everybody did was um, add a separate set of boxes that allowed you to control space war. They're handheld ones. He's right there in the middle. I, the I'm way, that's see. the back of my head. <laughs> that's Alan Kotak, who uh, didn't write any of the code, but was uh, one, of, one of the ones who provoked One of the it. Space War Six, right? He, he actually, well, he sort of triggered my getting the, my, 
He went and got the math code. Right? He took away my last excuse for not writing the code. I said, I didn't know how to write sine and cosine routines. <laughs> so he got a hold of sine and cosine routines and said, now what's your excuse? Yeah, do it now. <laughs> <laughs> write the demo. <laughs> By the way, you saw that that wasn't a keyboard that he was putting yeah. the game in. And uh, that Shag Gretz, uh, who worked on, uh, who tinkered the explosions to look right and uh, gave a paper at the users group meeting in, the, uh, in May of 62, and we put Space War in the, li in the users group library. His name was Shag and yours was uh, Slug, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, he was <laughs> He was very apparently not very happy about his first name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now uh, you're used to some sort of protection for computer uh, intellectual property. Yeah. Well, in 1962 you couldn't patent software, you couldn't copyright software. It just went everywhere. <laughs> well, it was <laughs> open source by definition. Yeah. Um, so, uh, anyway, uh, being in the users group and the users all knowing about it, uh, most of the PDP-1s had the minimal configuration which was the display and 4K of memory. And so, not having a better demonstration program, people used it to show things off and to show off their new computer. Show off how cool the PDP-1 is. <laughs> and uh, so since about half of the PDP-1s went into research laboratories or universities, there, was, there were a lot of people who saw Space War demonstrated. And uh, some people actually got copies of the code and translated it to the, to their, to the computer they had, and other people just looked at it and said, oh, and wrote their own. <laughs> they just reverse engineered it by yeah. looking at it. So, let's see. Um, so when in indie game developers create games with potentially contentious subject matter, like, you know, Space War, which is yeah. about kind of the Cold War, the war in space, um, they often take flack for doing so. So in, in creating Space War during that time, did you take any flack at all? No, not, well, there was no flack for the subject matter. There was flack to some extent for the idea of using computers to play a game. <laughs> You're wasting time. <laughs> it's valuable computer time. <laughs> Let me see. It, sh okay. it should be noted that I wasn't the first one to write a game for a computer. Yeah, Higginbotham did with the tennis for two. Yes, right. but that was an analog computer. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> Also, one interesting thing, um, you notice that the display is circular on the, uh, on the, on the, the display, which is yep. interestingly uh, not square. And uh, the resolution of the uh, display is 1024 by 1024, which is a rectangular dimension. So why did it come out uh, circular? <laughs> uh. This has to do with the history of digital. Um, the engineers who started digital equipment had worked on Whirlwind, which was an MIT project, which was uh, turned out to be the prototype for the SAGE air defense system. And so one of the things they had was a simple CRT display on Whirlwind. And one of the I was fortunate, Whirlwind was still running when I first showed up at MIT. And the people in the computer center had uh, worked on Whirlwind, and they arranged a tour just before it got shut down. And one of the things they had was a program called the Bouncing Ball, which had a wall, displayed a wall and a floor with a gap in it. And they pushed the ball, which was a spot off the uh, off the wall. Top of the wall and had it bounce realistically down and either off the screen or down through the hole. And apparently this was viewed as a very magic program when Whirlwind because at one point it was crucial in getting further support for the project. Needed some physics, something like yeah, that. Well, it convinced the physicists that yes, you could simulate <laughs> <laughs> things on, on a digital computer. Uh, and uh, 
I had seen that, so I, the idea of doing things on a display was not new to me. The tube itself was um, used in World War II air, uh, radar. With a mechanical scan radar, there's a problem in telling what's going on. And so if you have a spot on the screen that shows a target and it moves, the slow trail that it leaves shows you which direction it's going and that it's moving. And this is very interesting because that's the airplane you want to <laughs> you want to know about. Yeah. <laughs> so um, they had done it on Whirlwind uh, when digital was started. The engineers had by and large worked on Whirlwind. They thought a display was a good thing, and so the obvious thing was to dis design a display like Whirlwind. Okay. And in in many ways, the PDP-1 is a transistorized version of Whirlwind. Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> so when you did, when you finished, I guess, it kind of finished like the first version of, sp of Space War and it was running on the PDP-1, um, the game basically got copied somewhere else, right? It left the university, it went to another university. I know it Well, it was in the users group, so you could just order it. Okay, so you just... If you had a PDP-1, you just <laughs> order it from the users group, you get it. You get it, and then you take it somewhere else, and basically yeah. the game spread among all the universities that could actually create, you know, basically enter the program and run it. Yeah. Well, um, I, I was uh, talking to, a, uh, I volunteer at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, where we have a restored PDP-1, and I say essentially this, uh, and other people say, give their version of it. Uh, I was talking to a guy who had worked on a, he was a physicist, and he had worked on another computer, it wasn't a PDP-1, but it did have a display, for, and it, its intent was analyzing bubble chamber pictures. <laughs> but um, he had taken the versions, there were three or four different versions of Space War floating around in his uh, installation, and they were all buggy. Wow, and they were not ones that just the parameters were changed, but people uh, actually tried yeah. to add more code to it. Right? Yeah, and, well, it was a different computer, so. If, oh, it was totally. Yeah. Uh, anyway, he had brought them all together and debugged them so that you had a stable game. <laughs> nice. And this was, so this, when the code got moved around uh, to different universities and people were starting to, to do stuff to the game, some of, I mean, they had to translate it from a, one assembly language, the PDP assembly, to another assembly if it was on a different system. Um, interestingly, this was, was kind of the time of, of the first mod community. I think we would yes. call it. <laughs> Only within the university, but people were trying to make the game Well, the cooler, first, there was this mod better, community faster. that started up trying to get me to change the parameters. Right. When and you put them in there, and then the, everyone stopped. <laughs> yeah, I, I suppressed that one. But even at the very beginning, while you were making the game, uh, I guess while you were making the game, the, uh, you know, the expensive planetarium was kind of a mod to yeah, the game. Yes. It was like somebody oh, yeah. else put code in there. Oh, yeah. Well, it was... One of the lessons is that games are always collaborative. Uh, it's, it's clearer with, uh, to me with written word and movies. But the thing is, if you're creating stuff, you need a critic. You need an editor. Yeah. <laughs> Critique. <laughs> <laughs> and you better pay attention to the edit, what the editors have to say. Yeah, and so everyone was playing it, and they're giving yeah. exam you know, they're giving feedback, but they're also coding. And well, later on, uh, much later on, I was working in the briefly in the computer game business, and at the time, the rule of thumb was that uh, for each hour of engineering time in writing the game, you needed to spend about an hour of testing time in order to get the game to be adequately reliable. Yeah, well, I did a back, back of the envelope calculation on Space War. I got somewhere between 100 and 1,000 times more testing time yeah. <laughs> than it took me to write it. Well, actually, and it probably didn't take you so long to write it. It took you more time to just get the thing in the computer. <laughs> yeah. Well, and uh, this leads me to my boast, which is no outstanding crash reports, no user complaints, support still available. <laughs> Every month, twice, you know, twice a month at the Computer History Museum. <laughs> it's a record. It should be you know, Guinness, Guinness World Record there. Well, one of the secrets is it's damn small. Yeah. It was like 2,000 lines of assembly? Uh, around 2,000 lines of assembly code. Cool. Um, Including the outline compiler and the expensive Oh, everything theory. else in it. Okay. 
Um, so the legend is that when Space War reached Stanford, you know, finally went around all over the place. Well, Stanford um, had a PDP-1. Yeah, so, so they had to, you know, yeah. they had the machine that they didn't have to, like, translate to. They could yeah. just get it over there. Uh, students who played it just went nuts. This was basically, it blew their mind because it was the birth of a new medium, computer games. And they, they got to see this uh, for the first time when they got to see your game. And they said it was better than, like, psychedelic drugs back then. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that people's minds were being blown by computers? <laughs> well, Space War? Uh, I think Space War was the first computer game where people actually wanted to come back and play it again. It was a game, and it was fun, yes, and it, it was, was, was the, balanced, the so you felt like it was your fault if you lost. Yeah, well, you did have to learn something. Yeah, you had to learn the gravity. Yes. <laughs> Basically, about gravity, <laughs> prediction, acceleration, all that. Um, <clears throat> Let's see, um, I'm not sure if I've mentioned this before, but the PDP-1, um, the processor on that was pretty slow. Back in the uh, late 70s when home computers started, back with the Apple I and the Apple II and then the Commodore and, and all that, they were based on the 6502, which was a 1 megahertz computer, but the PDP-1 was a 0.1 megahertz computer. <laughs> and to get the game to be able to refresh it at 50, you know, 50 hertz? No, 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 no. 12 to 15 hertz. Oh, that was, <laughs> that's really fast. <laughs> well, uh, the, there wasn't, uh, it was timed entirely by memory cycle. Fortunately, PDP-1s always came at one speed, so I didn't have to worry about upgrades. But everybody that was putting stuff into the main loop had to worry about ruining the display, basically. Well, uh, the, <laughs> yeah. Uh, because one of the big challenges was reducing the sine and cosine computations because doing sines and cosines and square roots was uh, very leisurely. Yeah. Did, did, uh, <laughs> do you know if there was uh, the idea of uh, pre-generating like cosine and sine lookup tables? There like wasn't that? enough memory, no memory space <laughs> to make that attractive. <laughs> uh, actually, um, my numerical analysis wasn't terribly good, and I wasn't up on all of the possible programming tricks. So it might be that if someone wanted to re-engineer it, that they could do that. Okay. But um, it was... <laughs> <laughs> it was tough. <laughs> you had to use the instruction, yeah. and you had to wait for it, basically. Yeah. Um, the uh, PDP-1, when you were entering code into it, used a, a thing called a Flexo writer. Yes. Which was a very expensive typewriter. No, basically. it was, a well, it wasn't an exp expensive typewriter allowed you to do what a, what a $5,000 flexor writer did on a $120,000 computer. <laughs> okay. It was a little faster and a little better, but it, it was still, for doing program editing, by and large, you used the flexor writer. The flexor writer, um, some of you have met the Model 33 and paper tape. I don't know if anyone here has, <laughs> has seen paper tape. Paper tape is... <laughs> You know, ah, the, there's somebody up there. Somebody's seen paper tape. The Flexo writer <laughs> punched into basically yeah. paper anyway, tape. Anyway, it was a modified IBM Electric typewriter, which uh, roared along at 10 characters a second. <laughs> and it had a paper tape reader and paper tape punch on it and some controls. So when you were typing in your source code initially, uh, you would type it on this Flexo writer and punch paper tape. And then when you got the code done, you'd uh, run the paper tape through the flex writer again, printing out and getting a neat copy, and you'd go off and proofread that. <laughs> yes, paper tape, eight-channel paper tape. Yeah, because I've seen paper tape with just one, one stripe. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's also was two-channel paper tape for Morse code, and there was five-channel paper tape for teleprinters and teletype communication, and there was six-channel paper tape for typesetting. Wow. <laughs> All the things we didn't know. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, well, you want to see a really cool machine. You should see a, t a t line of type machine running off paper tape. <laughs> what channel? What, eight channel paper tape? Six channel. Six, okay. <laughs> um, the line of type for you. Is there anyone who knows what a line of type is? 
Oh, I've There's never some people, you. yeah. <laughs> a linotype machine is an 1890s mechanical machine which uh, manipulates the molds for individual letters. So you have a keyboard and you type at it and you get assemble these molds and then it automatically casts the line in type metal. And one of its charming features is if you don't fill out the line, the typecasting operation doesn't go right. Uh -huh. And the error message is it squirts hot type metal at your foot. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So give it a bunch of blank stuff. Then. <laughs> People, <laughs> typographers remember to fill the line. Yeah. <laughs> So they took a linotype machine and they just kind of retrofit it with... Uh, uh, in, yeah, in the, in the 60s, they, that was a popular thing. Nice. <laughs> Did they fix that error? <laughs> no. Bug in the machine? No, it, it's innate. <laughs> oh, it just happens. You can't stop it. <laughs> so when you were, um, when you were writing uh, Space War, I think everybody might understand at this point, uh, you were writing the game in assembly language, yes. which is... You know, uh, in a in a modern language like say C, which you know, some of, some of you here might know C. More of you might know a higher level language than that, like Java or or Python. Um, to to print something on the screen is as easy as just saying print quote and then your your text. But on a you know on a on a PDP or doing something in assembly, it's a lot of instructions to do that. Not bad. It's what, what, that was another great feature of the PDP-1. It had a simple typewriter interface. Did it have a font in it? Well, no, the, the font was, in the, was built into the mechanics of the typewriter. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it was roughly Courier 10. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so there, was, uh, there were two instructions, type out and type in. Nice. And uh, you put the character you wanted in the I.O. register and gave the type out instruction and the typewriter started up and typed the character. If you wanted to, you could check that it did it because you could do a type in uh, afterward and see what the typewriter claimed to have t printed. So you debug that way. Yeah. But uh, there was a different... That was very straightforward. Most of the other typewriter interfaces were line at a time or would only take numbers or something like that. So that was a relatively revolutionary feature of the PDP-1, nice. that it was simple. <laughs> uh, so input output wasn't too bad. Yeah. What was really bad was the typewriter. Because the typewriter was an IBM electric typewriter, which was designed to be used by people. And it <laughs> turns out people don't type at 10 characters a second for two shifts. Yeah. <laughs> Usually it's a lot faster than that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and furthermore, it was a modified version. IBM had one version that was too expensive for digital, which was, uh, had a solenoid for each key and just pulled on the key. And a contact for each type bar and told you which type bar hit. So they had, a, modification from an outfit called Soroban Engineering, which had a mechanical six bit to pull on the, uh, the key converter, and a mechanical what key actually hit the platen to six bit converter. <laughs> and they weren't too well designed, it turned out. Oh no. So it was infamously unreliable. Um, when I was working on Space War, the, it, very quickly MIT got two typewriters. So there's one to keep on the computer and one for the maintenance guy to fix. <laughs> and um, Just keep swapping them out? <laughs> yes, during the week. But nice. uh, several times in debugging Space War, which I did ten, tend to do on the weekends, um, because I was... I had, a, I had a day job. <laughs> uh, several times, I couldn't get anything done one weekend because both typewriters had failed by 6 o'clock Friday evening. Jeez, because everyone's banging on them all week. <laughs> and, uh, well, and they'd been swapping them out all week, but <laughs> Jeez. two of them had failed after the maintenance guy went home Friday. This is probably like analogous to, to 
people writing code with or, or making games with like faulty tools that crash and just do crazy stuff. And you have to keep on running and trying to get your work back and all that. Except yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's hardware this time <laughs> instead of software. Um, so the so when you um, when the game basically went around and uh, did you hear you heard about Space War uh, being played at other universities around the country? Oh yeah, and um, it turns out two of the uh, arcade game builders at least had seen Space War somewhere. Like Cinematronics, right? Uh, and uh, the guy who wrote the first um, uh, first asteroids. Mm -hmm. had played Space War at Stanford. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. And so, uh, you know, it, it was like me seeing the bouncing ball. Yeah. You know, okay, it we is. know how to do it. We know you can do it. The only problem is, can you do it on what's available? And the a $120,000 computer isn't suitable for an arcade. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that that was 18 years later, though, when Asteroids came out. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I think the Cinematronics one came out before that. Does they even have a date on that one? Well, there, um, there was a Cinematronics one. There was uh, Galaxy, which was Bill Pitt's one, which yeah, was famous for the, being in the Stanford uh, Student Center. Right, and that's what's at the Computer History Museum yes, right now. Yes, that's okay. running. Uh, Bill Pitt's has restored it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and, uh, so it's available all, all the time at Computer History. Yeah, I think this was uh, Tim Skelly wrote this one for Cinematronics. Um, and this is the one that people saw in the arcade, I guess. Well, and it also showed up as space. a home computer. And, yeah, and right. there was a, a home game system that was based on the cinematronic stuff. Somewhat oh, later. yeah, the Vectrex. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Has anyone heard about the Vectrex? <laughs> yeah, many of you? All right, cool. <laughs> so, yeah, the Vector. It's funny. Uh, so Space War didn't have a vector display. The nice thing about a vector display is you can just say point, you know, start a point draw to this point, and it physically moves. Ah, but their the explosions aren't as good as mine. Yeah. <laughs> you, had to, you had to plot every point, right? <laughs> uh, my explosions are really something like it's explosions. Totally, it's but, particle but, effects, basically, because all you had was dots. The cinematronics you know? explosions are just the, the vectors fly off in different directions. Yep, yep. Yeah, that was easy for them, just, you know, yeah. streak in different directions, but you had to actually put every dot on there to make it cool. <laughs> like the original part particle effect generator. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, so how did you feel about um, people playing the game, hearing that, that they liked it, and then modifying the game around the country, and then finally seeing it popularized in arcades where everybody could play them? Well, I learned a lesson. Uh, one of the things that the arcade games did, which I would have resisted because it was unrealistic, <laughs> was they added uh, viscosity to space. So the starting levels... Oh, the friction? When, yes. Yeah. When you, uh, the starting levels, when you got the spaceship going too fast, so it was just going zoom, 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 zoom across the, the screen, if you just took your hands off the display, if you just took your hands off the display, sorry, uh, then things would calm down so you could see what was going on. And that was... <laughs> That's not realistic. <laughs> yes. To suppress hyperspace. But <laughs> it, made it, it made it much easier to learn. Yeah. Um, okay, so it's like, in closing, I'd like to congratulate and thank you for the incredible accomplishment of kickstarting the world of computer game development a tidal wave of inspiration that continues to rise to ever higher levels over 50 years after your initial <laughs> supernova. How Thanks <purple>. a lot. <laughs>